Modern Railways. In-depth railway news. Hello and welcome to the preview of the July edition of Modern Railways. There's the cover. If you're wondering what that rainbow is doing there, Philip will be telling you about the supplement shortly. Well, not a great week at the time of recording with strikes going on. Although I'm glad to be at home after last week when virtually every train I went on was late. So there we go. Moving on to the July edition, Roger is next with a subject which defies understanding. What do you think it could be? ERTMS? Pneumatic brake systems? No. Worse than that, rail furs. And I should point out that Roger hasn't shrunk, he's just in a really big chair. Roger. Well, uh, hello again, and uh, welcome to the uh, latest uh, Informed Sources preview. Uh, this month, I do the journalistic equivalent of uh, walking across a tightrope without a safety net, uh, in that I take on a very specialist subject, fares and fares reform. Of course, fares reform is a, a major feature of the uh, William Shapps plan, and it's promised as one of the benefits of Great British Railways. Now, as with a lot of things in the William Shapps plan, um, great ideas at the end, but it's a bit unclear as how we're going to get there. Uh, so I thought it was time to take a look at fares reform, even though it's normally a subject for a very few specialists who spend their whole lives con uh, concerned with it. Uh, what I've done is gone back to see how we got to the present fares structure we've got today. And that goes back to 1965, uh, when... Uh, British Rail introduced selective pricing. Before that, fares were based quite sensibly on the distance travelled, and uh, uh, the selective pricing meant that you charged effectively what the market would bear. You adjusted prices to uh, increase revenue or possibly price people off if there was too much traffic or whatever. And it took a long time for this to be completed, uh, about 10 years to get into the uh, national, get a national affairs handbook and another 10 years for everybody to cut over to it. Uh, so I start there and then start looking at how fares uh, add up. Uh, I look at uh, how fares count in terms of uh, pence per mile nowadays, uh, compare a number of commuter journeys in terms of season ticket costs. And I also look at the issue of uh, affordability. Now, we all heard about uh, silly, ridiculously high prices for peak trains. And uh, I, I look at some of those and then try and work out what might be affordable compared with the average wage. Uh, at the end of it, uh, I conclude that uh, fares reform, uh, introduction of serious fares reform with the new fares structure is not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy. And of course, it can't really start until Great British Railways, GBR, comes into, it takes its legislative powers uh, in uh, around about uh, 2024. I make a stab, an optimistic stab that perhaps uh, you might have fares reform in by uh, perhaps 2030, uh, but to, for the government to actually get some sign of uh, changes of fares in time for the next election, they're going to have to be some more bodges. Uh, and one aspect of that is probably retail reform, where the ways of selling tickets will be made easier or simpler. Anyway, that's a, a, a big read uh, on, on a, a difficult subject, but uh, I think you'll find it useful and helpful. After that, uh, I have a little photo uh, review of things I saw at Railtex exhibition. Now, uh, nowadays, everything has to be digitalization, horrible word. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. So what I did was go around the stands looking at real hard, hard metal engineering and saw a number of interesting things, uh, particularly a new uh, bioreactor toilet uh, which uh, simplifies, which doesn't need emptying more than about four to six months' time and is, is completely clean. So that's one thing. It's being fitted to the Class 701s of Southwestern Railway, something I admit I missed. And, of course, the 701s uh, bring us to uh, Tinwatch, uh, where, of course, they haven't entered service yet uh, because of various uh, issues with drivers and commissioning. Anyway, uh, the commissioning was further halted by a ban by Alstom of people walking past them at ground level. This followed an exploding capacitor in one of the uh, Elizabeth Line trains, which blew off a cover on the equipment case. And that's not a good thing if you're walking by and something comes whizzing off with a bang. 
so um, I, I describe what happened there and the problem. Uh, it wasn't a diff- It wasn't an issue for. It was only an issue for people at ground level working on it, and they had to switch the power off if you wanted to work on it. Uh, but for passengers and people in a depot at, at platform level, that was all right. Anyway, I uh, described that, and the immediate solution is to fit stronger clamps to hold the doors on. So if a capacitor ever goes bang, and it only happens rarely, uh, the doors stay on. Propping up the bottle, bottom of the uh, tin watch table of reliability has always been the class 769s. And one of those caused problems at Preston when it came into the station and suddenly uh, electronic mayhem ensued, including wrong side track failures, uh, wrong side failures of track circuits. Uh, That's quite uh, obviously that is a a vital safety issue. And uh, they shut everything down rapidly. They found out that this was an uh, an electrical fault in the traction system. And uh, it was not a sort of electronics going haywire, as you'd normally expect, uh, but a piece of electromechanical equipment called a vacuum circuit breaker, which wasn't closing properly. So the electricity was jumping over the gap, causing arcs and sparks. And that's what uh, uh, caused the electronic mayhem. Uh, There's also the usual summary of um, train reliability. And there's a new format, which I think you'll find easy to understand. Uh, So that's all for this month. Hope you enjoy it, and uh, see you again next time. Thank you, Roger. That really is a big chair, isn't it? Now, the editor, Philip Sherratt, will tell you about the main features. The third rail network gets a lot of coverage, so anyone from the ORR might wish to look away now. Philip, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video preview as we look at the uh, July issue. So, um, in terms of features in the main magazine, Our lead features are about the third rail network this time, south of the River Thames. We have an interview with South Eastern's Managing Director Steve White, who took over last year, just around the time the operation transferred to the operator of last resort uh, from uh, Govia after the uh, financial uh, difficulties, shall we say there. So they're looking now at developing a long-term strategy for the operation, uh, focusing on rolling stock, um, and things like ticketing and, and so on. So it's, it's good to chat to Steve about all of that. And then in conjunction with that, we have a feature on the network rail side of things, looking at some of the projects that they're doing on Southern, as well as the work they're doing around improving performance and culture change within network rail. We have um, a, an assortment of other features from different areas, including a couple on the West Midlands, one is an interview uh, which uh, my colleague Tony Miles did with West Midlands Trains Managing Director Ian McCall, who's recently taken over, where we look at their preparations for the Commonwealth Games and their his sort of approach to the operation on taking over. And in conjunction with that, we also have a feature about Coventry Station. The new station building there was recently opened, and uh, James Lovett went to take a look, and you can read his thoughts about that. Another one from Tony is up in the northwest at Headbolt Lane. This is the new Mersey Rail Station that's being built to extend the network from Kirby. Uh, that's the branch where Mersey Rail and Northern trains meet, sort of um, end to end. Well, that junction is moving up to um, Headbolt Lane. And uh, so there's a new station being built, there's infrastructure alterations, but also there's a battery op- powered operation of Class 777s, the new Mersey Rail trains order from Stadler. So there's lots to talk about about that project in in that interview. And we also have a feature about Rail to Refuge. This is a very worthwhile scheme which was set up just before the pandemic, but really came into its own during the pandemic, offering free travel to those fleeing domestic abuse. So my colleague Andy Roden spoken to South East's Darren O'Brien, who conceived the idea for it, along with Women's Aid and the Rail Delivery Group, who helped to put it into practice and make it happen. And it, um, and it continues to be a success story, and it's a really good uh, story for the industry, I think. And we have a special feature this month about LGBT plus inclusion in rail. We've been working with Network Rail's LGBT plus uh, network, Archway, uh, which, although it's a Network Rail um, adjunct, it uh, does represent people from across the industry in the LGBT plus sphere. So we uh, look a, bit, a little bit about the work of Archway, some of the events uh, and the, that are organised. We have some personal stories from people in the industry. And we have a feature about Trainbows, the rainbow livery to trains that are a familiar cycle network from rail historian Tim Dunn. So I hope you find that, um, that interesting and something a bit different, but also something that's really important as the uh, industry looks uh, to improve its uh, inclusivity and its diversity. 
Uh, there's lots of news going on. I'm recording this on a, on a strike day, but um, uh, aside from strikes and some of the less good news, we have the success of the Elizabeth line since its opening. We have ScotRail's plans uh, to order battery trains and Transport Scotland authorising further electrification. Uh, so there is some good news about um, uh, to go with all, with all the bad. So we have a, a mixture of that as ever for you. So it's a packed issue, 116 pages. I hope you will find it interesting. Uh, it's certainly been an interesting one to put together. So that's it from me for now. Thanks very much for watching as ever, and I'll hand back over to Ian. Thank you, Philip. Uh, so it's on to my Pan Up column. Pan Up is in two parts this month. The main one being a collection of superannuated anorak trips to say goodbye to things. Firstly, the 455s on South Western. We took a trip via Reading to Guildford, calling at Effingham Junction and Shepparton, the old home of modern railways when it was an Ian Allen publication. I'm not going to pretend that this is a scenic railway journey, it certainly isn't, but we always learn something when we go on these trips. And our next trip was to Great Malvern, to go on the Great Malvern to Brighton service, now withdrawn. A bit of a weird route, of course, but a very scenic railway journey. And any excuse, really, for a trip to Great Malvern, it's a lovely place. Also lovely in its own way is Liverpool. And the third trip in this sequence uh, was so I could go and shoot some videos of 507s and 508s before they're replaced by the super cool new Class 777s. Actually, it'll be quite a while yet before they go, but this seems as good time as any. The video, if you want to see it, by the way, will be on my Ian Wormsley 2 sign on on YouTube in a week or two when I get around to editing it. <laughs> the other part of my pan up is one of my comedy pieces. I've had a go at writing Yes, Prime Minister, set in the Kremlin. Now, you might think that there's nothing funny about Russia at the moment, but the alternative world conjured up by their media people set me thinking about just how true some of our own press releases are. I won't spoil it any more than that, but if you still think it's in bad taste, I'll be sending my payment for that bit to the Ukraine Relief Fund. So, that's it for this month. Hope you enjoy the magazine, and see you next time, and hopefully by then we'll have some real trains running. On failing that, I'll use a model railway. Thank you. Visit www.modernrailways.com for more interesting and essential information about the British Railway Network.